Welcome back, everybody. New chapter today, chapter four, passive stabilization techniques as it can be applicable to spacecraft rotational motion. Okay, so in practice, typically people use active control systems to actively stabilize the rotational motion of the spacecraft. To do so, you need actuators on board, reaction wheels, control moment gyros, uh, little thrusters, things like that. But those actuators actually consume energy and resources and are heavy and bulky and stuff like that. So if we could find different ways to passively stabilize the rotational motion of a spacecraft without using any actuators, then that's going to be good news for us. Turned out there are two ways we're going to look at in this chapter to passively stabilize the rotational motion of a spacecraft. We're going to look at spin stabilization, dual spin stabilization, and gravity gradient stabilization. Okay. But before we jump to those three different techniques or strategies to stabilize the rotational motion of the spacecraft in a totally passive way, we have to discuss the concept of stability, okay? Because in this chapter, what we're going to do is that we will put our spacecraft into an equilibrium spin and then hands off. And then at one point, we're going to come and just perturb the spacecraft a little bit by injecting small uh, angular velocity components about x, y, z, and see where, whether or not we're going to come back to our previously obtained equilibrium state in terms of rotational motion, or maybe those small perturbing angular acceleration terms will cause the spacecraft to keep accelerating and ultimately uh, become unstable, okay? So we have to talk about stability before we jump into different ways to passively stabilize the attitude. Attitude stabilization via passive methods. All right, so what I just said is very important for you to understand. I said that we're going to put our spacecraft into an equilibrium spin. Graphically, that could look like this. If you have a ball on a hill or a ball at the bottom of a valley like that, okay? Those two points, if the ball isn't moving, are referred to as equilibrium, okay? So those two are equilibrium points of the ball here and of the ball there. Now, if we come in and we were to perturb slightly those equilibrium points, or if we were to push the ball one way or the other, just a little push here and just a little push here, we're going to see our ball moving away from our equilibrium state. But then here in this situation, the ball would gradually and slowly return back to its equilibrium. This is known as a stable system or stable equilibrium because when perturbed, it's going to come back naturally to its equilibrium. Whereas here, if you were to perturb the ball a little bit away from its equilibrium state, the ball would just move further and further away from the equilibrium and never get back to equilibrium. This is referred to an unstable equilibrium, okay? Unstable equilibrium. Whereas here we had stable equilibrium. Okay? So we're going to do the same thing for a spacecraft. We will first define an equilibrium state for rotational motion, and that will be whenever the rate of change of our angular velocity components are all equal to zero. And then, based on that equilibrium, we will observe what would happen if we were to inject small perturbing angular velocity terms to omega x, omega y, omega z. Would the motion naturally get back to equilibrium or will the motion then diverge and get unstable with time? That will be the main question that we'll seek to answer in that chapter. And then based on our understanding on 
stable, unstable equilibrium states, we will then look at three different ways to uh, make sure that the spacecraft remains stable whenever it would get disturbed by small pushes here and there, okay? And those techniques would be, again, the spin stabilization, the dual spin stabilization, and gravity gradient. Okay, so in 4.1, I just want to review something that you should already know, and that is the concept of stability of linear systems. Because uh, if we were to assume that the inertia matrix of the spacecraft is a principal axis uh, or is uh, defined with respect to principal axis body fixed reference frame, we know that we can decouple or rewrite the matrix equation, uh, which is Euler's equation of motion, into three separate scalar equations. And those three equations end up to be linear equations. So all this to say that we are dealing with linear systems in this course. So how can we infer or discover the stability of linear systems? Okay. I'm going to say a primer, so fundamental about stability of linear systems. And as you should know, the stability of any linear system is tightly related to its pole locations in a complex plane. Okay? Or equivalently, if you have a multi input, multi output linear system, which can only be modeled through A, B, C, D matrices then the stability of that system would be related to its eigenvalues, okay? But to begin with, let's just talk about the most fundamental linear system we can have, and that is a single input, single output system, which can be modeled via a transfer function that has a static gain k that multiplies uh, the s variables on the numerator plus some um, scalars like that, okay? Boom, 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 all the way to S plus ZM, and ZM, or all the Zs on the top are just random scalars that are added to the uh, dynamics variable of a transfer function in the S domain uh, to the S variable like that, okay? And on the denominator, we could have a series of S plus P scalar terms like that, all the way to, let's say, S plus P, M. And again, all the P's are some random scalars that are added to the S variables that define the dynamics variable within the S domain. Okay, well, just by looking at what we have on the numerator of the transfer function, we can say that the system, or alternatively, this transfer function has M zeros, right? Because you will remember that the zeros of a transfer function is whatever makes the numerator exactly equal to zero. So all you have to do then is solve that numerator equation and figure out the zeros of the system. So we're going to say that the zeros would then be S equal to whatever cancels this equation, which would obviously be either minus Z1, the scalar that was being added to the variable S here, or minus Z2, or all the way to minus Zm. So those are the zeros of the system. Similarly, just by looking at this transfer function, which again is only applicable to linear systems and furthermore, linear systems that have one input and one output, we can say that this transfer function, G of S, has N poles as well, right? And how do we find those N poles? Well, we need to find the values of S that make the denominator equal to zero. So we need to solve then that equation. 
which we have on the denominator, which is equal to zero. So we have to solve that to the values of s that would satisfy this. So then we're going to say that the poles of our system are going to be s equal either minus p1 or minus p2 or all the way to minus p of n. Because selecting any of these values for s would cancel that equation or make it equal to zero and therefore that value of s would be one of the poles. But as you can see, s would have n poles because there are n values that could make this equation go to zero. And similarly, we had m zeros because there are m values for s that will make the numerator go to zero. Okay, uh, generally speaking, poles and zeros are represented in a complex plane. I'm going to say poles and zeros in complex plane represented by variable s equal to sigma, which is a real value, plus minus omega, which is the imaginary component of this s variable. Okay, because these values here, p1 all the way to pn, and z1 all the way to zm, don't necessarily just need to be scalar, because they can be complex numbers that have a real part, as well as n or several imaginary parts, or one or two, <laughs> not several, okay? So this is the most generic way to write a pole and a zero in complex plane. So depending on what we have for the real part in the imaginary part of a pole and zero, we will then end up in three different situations. Leading to an asymptotically stable system, stable system or an unstable system. So first let's have a look at what would generate an asymptotically asymptotically stable system or in that example stable uh, transfer function. So asymptotically stable system implies that all the poles would have a negative real part. Negative real part. Such that if you were to look at what it would look like in a complex plane. Boy, the blue marker is dying on me this morning. Let's see if I have a leftover black marker that will work well for us. Okay. And what about this one? Okay. This seems to work. So we have the real axis and here you have the imaginary axis. So if all the poles are all on the left hand side of the complex plane, it means that you have poles here, poles here, poles there, for example, and so on and so on. That situation means that the system is asymptotically stable. Okay? And therefore, if you were to uh, perturb the equilibrium, it would get back to the equilibrium asymptotically. Okay? This is the ideal situation. Now what you can have also is a, a stable system. Which is different. So stability in that sense is different than asymptotically or asymptotical stability. Asymptotical. Is that even a word? Probably. So I'm just going to say that a stable system is different than an asymptotically stable system. 
because here all we need to satisfy is that no poles have a positive real part and if it has no repeated poles on the imaginary axis which means that now you are allowed to have poles that lie on the imaginary axis so you could have a pole here two there two there and as well as one here and one there and maybe one here as well so if you look at that you say okay i have no poles that have a positive real part that's good news and i have no repeated poles on the imaginary axis meaning that i don't have two poles on top of each other at the same location along the imaginary axis so that is different than the asymptotically stable situation where all the poles needed to be off the imaginary axis and on its left side as well okay so as soon as you have poles on the imaginary axis you are no longer asymptotically stable but instead you end up with a stable system which means that a stable system from that point of view if it gets perturbed away from its equilibrium state it would keep oscillating back and forth around the equilibrium state yet never converging back to a full equilibrium yet not necessarily diverging away from it okay so if you go back to the uh, ball at the bottom of, of a valley example that would mean that here for asymptotically stable if the ball gets pushed to one side it would oscillate but then slowly get back to equilibrium and stop moving again a stable system if you were to disturb that ball away from the equilibrium state it would just keep oscillating with a constant amplitude over time like that yet the amplitude of the oscillation will not grow with time that will be unstable nor will not shrink and give you back equilibrium so that this is kind of the uh, limit between a synthetically stable system and a fully unstable system and lastly obviously the last situation is an unstable system and that happens whenever you either have uh, one pole which is repeated on the imaginary axis and or poles that have a positive real part okay so that would be unstable system whenever a pole because all you need is one pole on the right hand side of the complex plane to give you instability for the entire system so a pole has a positive positive real part which is your sigma in that equation and or a repeated poles on the imaginary axis so if you go back to the complex plane you get this so you've got a pair of complex conjugate poles here one there one there everything looks uh, asymptotically stable makes you happy but then you have one pole here oh I'm no longer asymptotically stable I am now stable because I have one pole along the imaginary axis but G turned out to have not one but two poles directly on top of each other at the origin of the complex plane and therefore I have repeated poles on the imaginary axis right away you fall into the instability region 
unstable system. That's one situation, or the other thing that can happen is that you have a bunch of uh, poles here, so this looks like a synthetically stable. Oops. Now this is stable, and unfortunately you also have poles on the right-hand side of the complex plane, and that means that you are unstable, okay? And that would be the same even if you don't have any poles on the imaginary axis. As long as they're one of the poles on this side, here in this example I've drawn two, but you only need one to yield an unstable system, okay? So in terms of the ball uh, at the bottom of a valley analogy, that means that if you start at the equilibrium and you disturb that equilibrium by a little bit, the ball oscillatory motion in terms of amplitude would grow over time and it would just uh, become unstable, okay? Good. As a heads up, in this chapter, the three methodologies we're going to talk about to passively stabilize the attitude of the rotational motion of a spacecraft on orbit would at best, or will at best, give us a stable motion. There is no way we're going to be able to obtain an asymptotically stable motion just by using passive methodologies or passive techniques. So the best we're going to get out of those free, in terms of fuel, uh, energy, resources on board a spacecraft, uh, free techniques, is that we're going to get uh, a stable equilibrium. So our equilibrium, when being disturbed, will generate oscillations about said equilibrium, but with amplitude that remain constant over time. Okay, so in terms of time history of three different systems, look, uh, function of time, like this, and if you were to look at one of the three angular velocity components in body fixed reference frames, say omega x, omega x, omega x, the three situations we've just talked about, unstable, stable, asymptotically stable systems is the following. So we start at some equilibrium value for our omega x, for example, here, and we disturb it a little bit. So we give it a little offset. This is all equilibrium, eq, eq, eq. If it gets moved away from this equilibrium by a small angular velocity component that could be coming from uh, the environment, for example, a little perturbing torque, just moving an angular rate component away from its equilibrium. So we're now away from the equilibrium at t equals zero due to some uh, random effects on orbit. Then if you have an asymptotically stable system, it means that the angular velocity component on x will oscillate, but slowly get back to its equilibrium value. This is an asymptotically stable behavior. Now here, if the equilibrium omega x value gets disturbed a little bit, what can happen as well is that it would oscillate but just keep oscillating around the equilibrium value. So that would be a stable behavior. And the last situation obviously is an unstable behavior. So equilibrium gets disturbed a little bit, but then the oscillations will grow with time like that and obviously never converge back to equilibrium. So that one also never converges back to equilibrium, but at least the oscillations with respect to the equilibrium are said to be bounded or their amplitude is uh, reaching a max value and a min value and those two values are not going to grow with time. Okay? By the way, if you have an unstable system, depending if it's caused by 
poles that are repeated on the imaginary axis or poles that are on the right hand side, the unstable motion would, would look slightly different. So if you have a pole repeated on the imaginary axis, it means that the growth and amplitude of those oscillations would follow a linear trend like that. But if the unstable motion is obtained because you have at least one pole that lies on the right hand side of the complex plane, it means that the growth of these oscillations would be an exponential growth. Okay? Good. So that's kind of the primer in terms of linear stability from the Lyapunov perspective. Okay? Well, Lyapunov was a I believe Russian mathematician that laid out uh, several stability theory and theorems and lemmas, both applicable to linear and nonlinear systems. So that's the most fundamental description of stability, but applicable to linear system. Okay, so again, it all comes down to the location of your poles in your complex plane that would give you either an asymptotically stable system, stable system, or an unstable system. Now the last thing I want to talk about before jumping into 4.2 is that in the case of our spacecraft undergoing a rotational motion, our equilibrium point or equilibrium state, same thing, is going to be defined by omega x dot equal omega y dot equal to omega z dot equal to zero. Okay? So the angular, so the components of the angular velocity vector seen in the body fixed reference frame are not changing with time. This is the baseline equilibrium from which we'll look at perturbing a little bit and see what would happen for each of the three passive stabilization techniques we will investigate in this chapter. Okay? So keep that in mind. That's going to be the fundamental uh, assumption here throughout the chapter, and that is that our equilibrium point is defined by that, okay? Or by those specific values for the rate of change in our components of the angular velocity vector in the body fixed reference frame. Okay, so let's have a look at the first passive stabilization technique, which is known as spin stabilization. Uh, having a hard time with my markers. I need to go to Staples later today, I guess, to buy a bunch of new black markers. Because they all seem to work, but they only work for five minutes or so. Just pulling up all the black markers I have left, and I'll just keep switching between the black ones. Okay, so spin stabilization, uh, historically the oldest way of stabilizing the rotational motion of the spacecraft on orbit, the first spacecraft ever launched uh, back in the 50s and 60s, we're all using this passive way to stabilize our attitude because that was good enough for the missions in terms of fulfilling a specific task on orbit. The problem with that, as we will see, is that the uh, accuracy in terms of maintaining, say, a camera towards the ground isn't the best because the camera will keep oscillating back and forth with some uh, uh, amplitude. Uh, yet, this is a free way to stabilize the attitude, so people were excited about it and were using it tremendously back then. Nowadays, most spacecraft use active control techniques like feedback control systems uh, combined with uh, highly efficient actuators such as reaction wheels that are able to torque the spacecraft around and maintain a precise orientation in space. And that will come in chapter five. But first things first, spin stabilization is a passive way to stabilize the attitude Okay, so here we are assuming a principal axis body fixed reference frame, as I've mentioned previously in this lecture. So just to 
make sure that we're all on the same page uh, in terms of the equations of motion we're going to play with. This is Euler's equation of motion, rewritten specifically for principal axis body fixed reference frame. And notice that this allows me to write the equations of motion as or in terms of three scalar equations that are all linear. Okay, so linear equations. J Y make a Y dot plus J X minus J Z omega X omega Z equals zero because this is a torque free environment that we are considering here which again the torque free assumption works well over a short period of time because the perturbation torques we saw in the previous chapter are relatively small in terms of magnitude and especially when you look at their effect over a short time frame their effects are almost negligible it's when you start to look at their effect over say one two or x orbits that they are really uh, noticeable so jy minus jx omega x omega y okay so let's try to pick the values for omegas that would give us the equilibrium in terms of equilibrium state. So if you were to pick omega x equal omega y equal to zero, as well as omega z equal to some random constant, the constant, and let's define that constant to be equal to mu, that, then what you do is that you then substitute this into the equations of motion. So omega y, x omega y equal to zero means that this term gets canceled, that term as well, and this term as well. And surprise, surprise, you end up with omega x dot, omega y dot, omega z dot, all three equal to zero, which means that those conditions imposed on omega x, omega y, omega z represent an equilibrium state or an equilibrium point or an equilibrium condition. Those things are all synonyms for our spacecraft because the equilibrium was defined with the rate of change in omegas to be equal to zero. Okay, so that works out. Which means that the spin about BZ only, so it's been about a single axis, represents an equilibrium. Great. And this is where the concept of spin stabilization comes from. So we're spinning the spacecraft along one of its uh, unit vectors, and in that case, for demonstration purposes, we had used uh, BZ for the spin axis and then we'll see whether or not that gives us a stability behavior whenever that equilibrium state or condition gets perturbed by small amount okay and those small perturbations imposed on the angular velocity components could very well be coming from uh, perturbing torques for example all right and that's what we're going to look at in 4.2.1, where we will analyze the stability of this particular equilibrium point. Okay, so instead of plugging omega x equal omega y equal zero and omega z equal nu in the equations of motion, what we're going to do... Oh, Section has the title, Stability Analysis. Okay. We're going to set omega x 
to be equal to some small values denoted by epsilon x. We're going to set omega y to be equal to some small value you know, by, denoted by epsilon y. And omega z will become equal to its nominal value. So with respect to the spin rate, this is mu, but perturbed by some small amounts as well. So now, essentially, we took our ball away from its equilibrium by some small amount. Moving the ball here. And then we're going to let go of the ball and observe the behavior with time. Will the ball go back to 0, 0, mu? Or will the ball keep oscillating with constant amplitude? Or maybe the ball will want to roll further and further away from this equilibrium. Or in other words, those components would grow with time. So that is the bulk of this subsection here. So we perturbed our states away from the equilibrium, defined by 0, 0, nu. And then let's just insert these three things back into our Euler's equation of motion. Okay, so we're going to substitute omega x with this. So I'm going to get jx epsilon x dot, because that is equivalent to my former omega x dot, plus jz minus jy. And here I had omega y, omega z from Euler's equation from before. Well, now my omega y and become epsilon y, and omega z is now u plus epsilon z, all this equal to zero. So that is the new equation along bx direction in terms of equations of motion. And then I'm going to do the same for the y equation, that is replace my omega y with epsilon y, my omega y dot with epsilon dot y that plus the difference in principal moments of inertia like this before but then times omega x and now omega x is epsilon x and times omega z where omega z is now mu the nominal spin rate about the z unit vector plus some small perturbation away from the equilibrium like that. And lastly, you do exactly the same for the z equation. You obtain jz times omega z dot. Omega z is now mu plus epsilon z. So these two terms being dotted like that. Plus a difference in principal moments of inertia. That is a change. Times omega x, which is now epsilon x, times omega y, which is now epsilon y, equal zero. Okay? Now, one thing to realize here is that the nominal spin about bz unit vector had been defined to be a constant from our discussion on the equilibrium state, the rotational motion of our rigid spacecraft. So if that is a constant, that means that mu dot is equal to zero. Furthermore, we had talked about these perturbations away from the equilibrium as being small, right? We're taking our ball that sits at the bottom and then we're moving it away from the equilibrium but not all the way out, just a little bit away. Meaning that whenever we're gonna get uh, a multiplication of any of those two, so in time we're gonna get an epsilon square, uh, term, and we're going to say that this is approximately equal to zero because of the fact that these are considered to be small deviations away from the equilibrium. 
Okay, so that means that those equations here can be rewritten as Jx epsilon x plus the difference in principal moments of inertia x, uh, z and y. And now, if we were to distribute the epsilon y to this parenthesis, we'll get epsilon y times mu plus epsilon y times epsilon z, and that would be canceled. So all we have here is epsilon y times mu equal to zero. And you do the exact same for the other two equations, and you end up with the following, jx minus jz. Here the multiplication of that one with this one is approximated to be equal to zero, and you're left with epsilon x times mu. Like this. Lastly, in this equation, we have the mu dot term, which is zero. So we end up with jz epsilon z dot plus, look what we have here. We have the square of two epsilons, okay? Meaning that this is equal to zero or approximated to be zero, such that that's all you have for the z equation. Like that. Okay? And the reason why the z equation is different than the x and the y equations is because we have defined the spin to be about the z direction of body fixed reference, reference frame. So should we have defined another equilibrium being, say, omega x equal to omega z, both equal to zero, and putting our spacecraft into a spin about the y, then that would mean that the y equation here would have been the one different than the two other ones, okay? Because the new dot term would end up being part of the y equation and would have canceled this term, okay? Uh, but here, because we had to find the spin about bz, that's why we end up with the bz equation being slightly different than the other ones. So, if an exam I were to tell you examine or analyze the stability of a spin defined by omega x or even omega y equal omega z equal to zero and omega x being the spin with the new constant value, then you would need to do the, the whole derivation yourself and end up with this equation now being different than the last two and keep going with the derivation, okay? So what I'm showing you here is the methodology to analyze the stability of a given equilibrium condition. But there's more than one equilibrium condition that could give us uh, omega x dot equal omega y dot equal omega z dot equal to zero. Okay? Just keep that in mind. So make sure you understand the steps I'm taking here. So just by looking at this, It means that the motion about the z direction is going to give us the z remaining constant with time. Okay? So that perturbation we are injecting uh, or that we are adding to the nominal spin rate about bz will not disappear but will remain constant with, with time. So it will not disappear, meaning that mu will not get back to its value when perturbed by epsilon z, but nor will it grow with time. So that's good news, because that means that the motion about z will not be stable. I will not be unstable, <laughs> okay? So this is a stable behavior about the bz direction. That's good news. Well done. You figured out the stability about one of the three 
unit direction of body fixed reference frame when the spacecraft is initially spinning at some equilibrium and gets disturbed away from the equilibrium. Good. So what we have to do next is that we need to shift our focus to only these two coupled linear differential equations to analyze what would be the behavior of epsilon x and epsilon y as a function of time to infer about the stability about those two other axes. Okay, so I'm just going to rewrite those two equations as being epsilon x dot plus jz minus jy over jx. I'm just dividing everything with jx essentially times epsilon y. I'm going to put the new term here such that I have the derivative of a dynamical variable plus all this together is going to be a constant times epsilon y which is the other dynamical variable all this equals zero like that and I'm going to do the same trick for the y equation I'm going to divide everything with jz to be able to write jx minus j jy, divide everything with jy, sorry, like this, times mu, times the other dynamical variable, which is epsilon x. So now you clearly see that we do have indeed linear differential equations because the factor that multiply each dynamical variable are just a bunch of scalars. One, one whatever whatever scalar or constant times other variables here okay great that's good news because we know how to analyze the stability of such linear differential equations and the trick to do that is just to apply the laplace transform and then figure out the poles of the resulting equations to be able to infer about the stability along those two axes okay so that's what we're going to do next, and that is to apply the Laplace transform of those two equations. So Laplace transforms of those will give me, without forgetting about the initial conditions, when you apply the Laplace transform. So the derivative in time ends up to be S times the variable in the S domain minus the initial value. Uh, for this particular variable plus whatever constant we had in front of the other variable which is simply the variable but in the s domain and all of this is equal to zero obviously okay now uh, same thing applied to the y equation, so s epsilon y in the s domain minus its initial condition on y, please, not x, epsilon y not, plus this ratio of principal moments of inertia over jy times mu the nominal spin rate we gave about bz times epsilon x in the s domain, just like that. Okay, so that, that process looks, or should look familiar, right? When we had looked at the uh, natural or torque free motion of the spacecraft on orbit, we had to do something similar than that, and that was to take the Laplace transform and pull the initial conditions on one side, rewrite that in a matrix form, get the inverse of that matrix, and yada, yada, yada. And that's exactly what we're going to do next, okay? So just repeating the process we had already used in another chapter. So I'm going to flip my initial conditions on that side. 
And you know what? I'm going to use the magic of the board to do that. This way, I'm going to save some ink in my markers. Equal to epsilon x dot epsilon y dot. Yep. So next, I'm going to turn this into a matrix form where what I want here is essentially a 2 by 2 matrix that multiplies the dynamical variables. And then this is going to be equal to whatever we have on the right hand side, and that is just a 2 by 1 column matrix filled with initial conditions on those two variables that are, that are allowed to vary with time. Okay? Epsilon x, epsilon y, like this. So here I need to have s times this, so s times epsilon x, plus this big factor that multiplies epsilon y. So that big factor will be along here, jz minus jy over jx times mu. So s times epsilon x plus this times epsilon y equal epsilon x dot. That is exactly what we have in terms of equations. So that works out. Uh, we're going to repeat the process this time for this equation. So we have s times epsilon y. So my s goes here plus this factor that multiplies epsilon x, and therefore the factor has to be written in the second row, first column of this 2 by 2 matrix. Like this, continue. So this is equivalent to that, just written in a matrix form. So what did we do at that point back then? Well, we need to solve for these, okay? And perhaps I should have been more explicit and say in the S domain here. Okay. Not too difficult because we know how to take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix by hand. We did that together in chapter 2. So to be equal to the inverse of this 2 by 2 matrix times the initial conditions imposed on the two variables of interest. Again. Turns out that this 2 by 2 matrix will be I'm not going to do the derivation for you because we did that together once. And I assume that you know the process. So that would be 1 over the determinant times those two entries flip and those two with the negative sign where the determinant is simply this times this minus this times that. Okay? So if you were to do that on your own, you would get the 1 over determinant term to be 1 over S square plus alpha times the same matrix, but with the negative signs. There's Jz minus Jy over Jx. Boom, boom, times mu. And here minus Jx minus Jz over Jy times mu. And all this will be equal to epsilon x in the s domain and epsilon y in the s domain just like that where uh, i've used this way of writing the determinant term and specifically i've defined the variable denoted by alpha and that alpha was equal to jz minus jy times jz minus jx all this over Jx times 
jy and all this multiplying mu square so this term is coming from the multiplication of those two things together essentially okay so we have our s square this times this minus this times that and minus of this times this gives me that okay good but if you want you could also rewrite those two expressions in terms of scalar equations now Ooh, the microphone still working I just tap on the uh, on the cord here. Testing one two one two. We're good. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to write based on this matrix equation that epsilon x in the s domain will be equal to. Uh, well, we have this times this guy this times this minus this times that minus jz minus jy over jx times mu times epsilon y naught and all this being divided by s square plus alpha, okay? And you can just repeat the process for the equation along y, where you will get s epsilon y naught minus the ratio of principal moments of inertia difference. Okay, one of this, times mu, times epsilon, x naught and all this being divided by the same denominator in the first equation which is s square plus alpha isn't that interesting Yes, because if you look at those two equations, they share the same denominator. And therefore, we can say that they share the same poles. Wow. So if one has, say, unstable poles, it means that the other one also has unstable poles. Okay? And those poles are given by S equal and minus alpha square root and plus minus because I had just solved that expression for my s variable which gives me the pole location in the complex plane very very interesting because now just based on the value we have alpha at we will end up with poles at totally different locations in a complex plane. And based on that, we will be able to put in uh, a condition on alpha to ensure that my poles don't end up being uh, unstable. or don't end up in the right uh, half plane of the complex plane. Okay? So that's what we're going to do next. And that is regardless of what was happening at the numerator of those two equations. Because the stability is uh, derived only from the pole locations or from the denom denominator. All right, so case one. Let's assume that alpha happens to be a positive number. If that's the case, that would mean that the pole location would be at 
plus minus square root of negative of a positive number. So square root of a negative number, meaning that this is j square root of alpha. So in terms of the complex plane, that means that my two poles, because I had a second order uh, equation on the denominator, thereby obtaining two poles, obviously. So the two poles in the complex plane would then be located at plus j square root of alpha here and minus j square root of alpha along the negative direction of the imaginary axis. So, what kind of behavior would you see whenever the omega x and omega y uh, components are being disturbed by small quantities denoted by epsilon x and epsilon y, respectively? Right? Just by looking at that, what kind of motion would you get? Well, you would get a stable motion because that is not asymptotically stable because you don't have negative real parts for the two poles, but you have poles along the imaginary axis. Thank God they're not repeating, right? They're not on top of each other because that would be unstable, as you know, unstable with the linear growth and amplitude of the oscillations. But here what you would observe for omega x and omega y as function of time just by virtue of the pole location dictating the behavior of epsilon and thereby the behavior of omega x and omega y. So we had omega x at the equilibrium being equal to zero and same for omega y, okay? Omega x and omega y. Now these two had been perturbed by a small quantity denoted by epsilon x and epsilon y, respectively. Okay? And now the question was, what would be the behavior of those two uh, components, epsilon x, epsilon y? Well, to discover that, we needed to figure out the poles dictating the motion of those two things. And the poles are telling us that that will result in an oscillatory behavior around the equilibrium, just like that, with amplitudes that remain constants with time. Okay? That's what it means. Or in other words, the rotational motion about the x and the y remains stable. And that is good news, right? It is not asymptotically stable in the sense that those oscillations won't disappear with time to give you back your equilibrium. Yet, it is stable, which isn't too bad for uh, a passive stabilization technique that doesn't require any power, that doesn't require any fuel, or that doesn't require any actuators, okay? All you need is a spin motion about Bz, and then when that spin gets perturbed a little bit by some uh, factors encountered in orbit, uh, the motion would still keep oscillating, okay? But yet with a bounded amplitude. You'll never get back to a pure spin about one axis. You will always get those small oscillations about Vx, Vy as time goes on. But those oscillations would remain constant. So that is good news, okay? Happy. Case one makes us happy. Let's have a look at two other cases that can arise just based on 
the value we set for alpha. So in case, let's keep case one up there. Case two will be whenever alpha happens to be exactly equal to zero. If that's the case and we're to plug alpha in the generic formula for the poles, which by the way was S equal plus minus square root of minus alpha. If alpha is equal to zero, then you get S equal to a pair of poles at the origin of the complex plane. That's not good news because you know by now that that kind of uh, duplication in terms of the poles along the imaginary axis would always give you an unstable behavior. So unstable meaning that the oscillations you would see uh, would grow with time in a linear fashion. All right, Because the poles are not on the right hand side of the complex plane and therefore the amplitudes are not growing expansionally yet they are growing linearly. Okay, Boom, 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 as I've shown on the board previously in this lecture. So that's not good news. So that would mean that when perturbed away from their equilibrium values, the motion along Bx and By would get unstable. So pretend that I'm the spacecraft initially spinning about Bz, direction like that, and then all of a sudden there's something pushing me off course, so I start oscillating about Bx and By as well as Bz. So I do this little dance here, like that. But then, because I had a value of alpha equal to zero, those oscillations would start to grow and grow in time, and then the spacecraft would start spinning upside down and sideways, and first thing you know is that you've lost control of your spacecraft. Just because this value happened to be equal to zero. So at the end of the analysis of the few cases, I will relate those to what it means in terms of principle and moment of inertia values because remember that alpha is a function of jx, jy, jz. Okay? So that doesn't make you happy. Case number two, unstable with linear growth in amplitude. Case three now. Case three is whenever we have alpha, it happens to be less than zero. Okay, and what does that mean in terms of my two pole locations? Well, it means that if you swap alpha with a negative number, you get the poles at plus minus square root of alpha of a positive number, okay? Because alpha is, say, negative 5, negative, negative 5 gives you let me write it differently to not confuse things. So the norm of this of this, okay? Let me just say, I'm not sure if that's confusing to you because it's the square root of negative alpha, but alpha is negative itself, such that you end up with plus minus square root of a positive number. It's not as if alpha within here is negative. I would be back to the square root of negative. Okay, okay. Let me just say square root of positive number here under the square root term, okay? That means that in the complex plane, you end up in a situation where you have one of the poles, they're both along the real axis. There's no imaginary components as we had here. But one is on the left hand side. That is your square root, your negative square root of minus alpha. And that would be your positive square root of minus alpha, alpha being negative, square root, of, okay, let's write it this way. Okay, anyway, you get a positive pole and a negative pole 
that's all I meant to say. It's a little bit confusing to me because now I've set alpha to be negative and the equation says negative of alpha. So negative negative means it is going to be plus minus square root of, you know what? Let's keep what I had, the positive number. And that positive number in terms of magnitude will be the absolute value of negative alpha. We're cool with that? Negative square root of absolute of negative alpha. Like this. And here, we call that plus square root of the magnitude or the absolute of negative alpha. Cool. That tells us right away that this thing is completely unstable with an exponential growth in the oscillatory behavior or growth in the magnitude of the oscillations. And that too doesn't make you very happy. So if you look at the three different cases that can take place based on the shear value of your alpha parameter, it means that there's only one case which will lead to a stable behavior of the rotational motion whenever that motion gets perturbed by small quantity. Okay. So we need to get alpha larger than zero. Well, let's go back to the definition of alpha we had before, which was jz minus jy times jz minus jx times mu square all this over jx times jy so we want alpha larger than zero which means we want this to be larger than zero or in other words we want jz minus jy times jz minus jx. This is always larger than zero, so you can cancel it out of the equation, essentially, a zero on that side. So we want this to be larger than zero. That is the takeaway of all this stability analysis. So how could we make sure that the spacecraft defined through its inertia matrix would end up in a stable rotational motion whenever that spacecraft is being spun about a single axis and then that this equilibrium gets perturbed on orbit? How can we ensure that the result is going to be a stable rotational motion? Well, from that we can say that we need to have either jz larger than jy and jz to be larger than jx to ensure that those two parentheses are positive that is the first choice that would make uh, this inequality to be satisfied or the other alternative is to have jz being less than jy and jz be also less than jx to get those two parentheses to be negative and therefore end up with something larger than zero when those two are multiplied together. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that here jz needs to be the largest principal moment of inertia whereas here that would mean that jz better be the smallest of all moments of inertia within the inertia matrix. Okay, 
And this is a key practical implication of this theoretical analysis or derivation. Because this tells us that if you want to obtain a stable rotational motion about Bx and By, whenever the spacecraft is being spun about its Bz direction by some nominal values, it means that the axis with which you spin the spacecraft about which is BZ, needs to have the associated principal moment of inertia to be either the largest or the smallest value of the inertia matrix. And if you remember the discussion we had at the very end of chapter one when I talked about the inertia matrices and how to relate the principal moments of inertia to the BX, BY, BZ unit vectors of the body fixed reference frame and where I had told you that the smallest of these three principal moments of inertia is associated with the minor axis of rotation. The largest was the major axis of rotation, and the one in the middle was the intermediate axis of rotation. Well, all this tells us that to obtain a stable behavior, we need to spin the spacecraft about either its major axis of inertia or about its minor axis of inertia. This is a very fundamental and key result of spacecraft attitude motion. So, we need to spin a spacecraft about either its major axis of inertia or its minor axis of inertia. So if I were to give you the inertia matrix of a spacecraft that would look like J equal seven, six, and I say pick the axis of rotation such that when such that you end up in a spin stabilized configuration, which is all of this analysis, right? We spun the spacecraft about one axis to stabilize it. So spin stabilization is just that. And you remember that this uh, rule applies, you're gonna say, well, I would have my spacecraft spin about its Bx unit vector, for example or just by looking at the values in my inertial matrix, or it's BZ unit vector. So one of those two uh, direction of body fixed reference frame in terms of spin direction would give me or would lead to a uh, passive spin stabilization configuration, which is great, okay? Or alternatively, if the inertia matrix would have been 9, 1, 3. And get, in that case, you're going to tell me that I need to spin about either the Y, which is my major axis of rotation, or about BX, which in this particular scenario is my minor axis of rotation. Never try to spin a spacecraft about its intermediate axis of rotation. That will always lead to a catastrophe, okay? Because the oscillations about the other two axes would grow with time and then the spacecraft would end up in a flat spin or a spin upside down and you lose control of the spacecraft and you lose control of the mission entirely, okay? Key takeaway result of spin stabilization. The only problem with this conclusion is that this is based on a theoretical analysis that was using Euler's equations of motion, which are modeling the dynamical behavior of a rigid body. Turns out, however, there's no such thing in practice as a perfectly rigid body. So this assumption makes this conclusion 
a theoretical conclusion and it's not directly transferable to practice. Okay? But why is that? And that's what we're going to look at in section 4.2.2. And specifically, we're going to talk about the major axis rule for Point two, point two. Okay. The reason why we need to further examine the conclusion drawn from the previous theoretical analysis is again because in practice, a rigid body, perfectly rigid body, does not exist. Exist. If you think about a spacecraft. It typically has expendable solar panels. Themselves are flexible. So whenever the spacecraft spins, the, the panels will kind of flex and rotate a little bit about the spacecraft. Or it could have a deployable antenna to communicate with the ground or another spacecraft. That antenna could be a long width. Well, obviously, because it is you know, kind of flimsy in terms of structure, whenever the spacecraft rotates in space, that antenna would deflect and oscillate. So those deflection motions of solar panels, of structural components protruding out of the spacecraft, flexible antennas, robotic arm, all those things have the effect of dissipating energy. Okay? So With that kind of concept in mind of energy dissipation, let's have a look at the uh, kinetic energy denoted by T of a major axis spin. Okay? In that case, the kinetic energy, whenever the spacecraft is spinning about its major axis, is going to be equal to one-half J major, which is the largest entry in the uh, inertia matrix, times omega square along the major axis, okay? But we know that this can be related to the angular momentum H about the major axis, because H is simply J times omega. And because it's a square, I'm going to square both terms here, such that I can rewrite and my omega in terms of h over j. h over j major major will give me omega major and square everything here. Okay? So I'm replacing my omega, my angular rate about the major axis square with this square over the inertial matrix square to rewrite that I'm going to get one half j major times h the major axis over j major square or simply one half angular momentum about the major axis square over j major like that. This gives me the kinetic energy uh, about the major axis, okay? Turns out I can do the exact same development, but this time for the kinetic energy of a minor spin axis and end up with one half angular momentum about this particular axis of rotation, which is the minor axis in this case, over its associated principal moment of inertia denoted by J minor. Nice. Well, what do I know about 
angular momentum h. If the principle of conservation of angular momentum holds here, or in other words, we are neglecting exter external torques, that means that h major beta b equals h minor, right? Or alternatively, I can square both terms here and just solve those two expressions for h major and h minor respectively and end up with two kinetic energy of the major axis times principal moment of inertia of the major axis equal to two times kinetic energy about the minor axis times its associated principal moment of inertia. Obviously I can cancel the two terms like this and end up with that. Which means that if those two sides happen to be equal and this one is much higher than this one must mean that this one must be larger than that one such that the product of these two are equivalent. Or in other words, I can say that a uh, major axis spin would minimize the kinetic energy up or down to the point where the energy reaches its minimum value. Okay? But if I were to spin about the minor axis of inertia, which is the smallest value of the inertia matrix, that implies that the kinetic energy about that axis will get maximized and will grow with time. And that's not good news, okay? And therefore, because of this reason, we can kind of conclude that a minor axis spin maximizes kinetic energy as opposed to minimizing it, which is a good thing because you would start from a high kinetic energy and slowly calm yourself down and get back to the equilibrium. But here, a minor axis just does, just does the opposite. It maximizes the kinetic energy. Okay? And this, is, this has a major implication in terms of practical applications of the previous analysis which was a theoretical analysis that did not take into account energy dissipation and the fact that the equations of motions are not 100% accurate because everything had been modeled as a rigid body. But in practice, we have deformations. So heat dissipation and mechanical energy dissipation and all that causes then the minor axis spin, which maximizes the kinetic energy, which isn't a good thing, to then be also an unstable spin axis, all right? So that small kind of uh, thought process turned into basic equations is just there to illustrate the fact that not only the intermediate axis spin is unstable, is unstable but also the minor axis spin would yield an unstable rotational behavior uh, this is not, I would say, the most formal way to demonstrate that. This only showed that the minor axis maximizes the kinetic energy from which I inferred that that would mean that we get an unstable spin. Now, the proper way to demonstrate that would be to go back to the same analysis we did, but instead of using Euler's equations of motion, we'd have to use flexible uh, dynamical equations of motion, which is way beyond the scope of this course, okay? But this only shows that we can kind of infer this very uh, important result, which leaves us with only one choice to spin any rigid body or any spacecraft 
about an axis to end up in a stable motion whenever that initial equilibrium would get disturbed by small quantity in terms of angular rates. And that only choice is the major axis. Hence, major axis rule. I'm going to write it here. Only a major axis spin gives a stable motion whenever the equilibrium gets disturbed away from that said equilibrium, okay? And this is known as the major axis rule. Major axis rule. Fundamental rule in spacecraft attitude dynamics and control. Never forget about it. That rule was actually discovered in a very empirical way back in the 60s, I believe. 90, oh, no, 50s? 60s, 70, 80 years? No. But the first American spacecraft ever launched was known as the US Explorer 1. That spacecraft had been designed with a pencil shape configuration. It looked something like that. Okay? That was US Explorer 1. That looked like a missile essentially. So if you look at that configuration, it should be obvious that the minor axis of inertia is the actual axis here, okay? Minor axis. And the control engineers and structural engineers have talked together and come up with that structure to then spin that spacecraft about this minor axis of inertia, just like that, to achieve passive stabilization of the spacecraft. Well, that works great in theory, right? They had all the same theoretical equations we've developed uh, together to, today in this lecture. They say, huh, either major axis or minor axis will, would, would, work, would work well, sorry. So let's pick the minor axis in terms of the spin, make sure that we end up in a spin-stabilized configuration without having to use any thrusters, you now expelling propellant like that or any internal moving components like reaction wheels that are spinning and therefore changing the angular momentum of the spacecraft. They wanted to keep that spacecraft as simple as possible. No thrusters, no internal moving parts, no nothing. Let's just spin that thing about its minor axis and that will be stable. Well, it was stable, but just for a few hours. Because this spacecraft also had those very long whips in terms of antenna flying off the side. So whenever they start to spin that spacecraft about that major, that minor axis, those long weepy antennas start to flex around and move in all directions, which they were fine with from a communication perspective. Because these, as you know, are omnidirectional antennas, so uh, regardless of their orientation, they always radiate the same uh, electromagnetic patterns. So the fact that they were flexing around was known and was not of a concern from a communication point of view. But from a control point of view, because now that whole body is no longer rigid as itself, because it has flexible elements, Euler's equation of motion is not directly applicable, and therefore the theoretical analysis that said major or a minor axis spin are totally fine and are stable was no longer valid, okay? And what ended up is that just after a few hours on orbit, that spacecraft, instead of just spinning about this axis, started spinning greatly about the other two axes, about X and Y, because it had been perturbed, obviously with some perturbations on orbit, and ended up in a flat spin 
like that after just a few hours on orbit and they've lost communication and they've lost total control of the spacecraft and that was a total disaster okay and that's how people went back to the uh, pen and paper analysis and figure out oh yeah that was in a rigid body that was a flexible body and therefore uh, the conclusion drawn after that analysis was not the most accurate and turned out that only a major axis spin is passively spin stabilizable that's even worse okay so never forget about us explorer one total disaster for the united states but thank god we've learned about the major axis rule through that experience okay enough for today uh, hope you're still following along in terms of writing equations on your loose piece of paper and that you, you are still progressing well throughout the problems provided at the end of each chapter, that you're still having fun, that you're still learning a lot. And until then, keep up the good work. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye.